All right, guys. It's another cold winter night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is a Sunday night. It is a beautiful moonlit, a little bit chilly Sunday night here. That would be Sunday, where are we? December 4th, 2022, counting down the days. 2022, so uh, <clears throat> if you caught my video yesterday, I did cover that excellent article by a fellow named Christopher Ketchum, who I had never heard of, but in that story, he interviewed uh, a fellow named William Reese and actually referenced this long, involved piece by uh, William Reese, so we're going to uh, kind of flesh out what we were talking about yesterday and check in with William Reese. Uh, I have had the great pleasure of interviewing William Reese, and uh, I will try to remember to put the link to that interview and highly suggest you listen to William explain all this in his own words, but uh, this is, uh, for those of you who are not aware who is, he, uh, William Reese is, uh, he's a professor of ecology at um, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and he is one of the great minds on what is going on on this planet, and we're going to go back to July of 2021, coming out of, this is from a website called ResearchGate, and good Lord, guys, I'm only going to have time to read about the first half of this essay, but I will put the link, and you can take it from here, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to have... Uh, well, we're going to hear the lead up to the name of the article is Growth Through Contraction. Yeah, Growth Through Contraction, Conceiving an Eco-Economy. So we will uh, not be getting into the eco-economy part of the... Uh, of this. We're just going to... I guess, read the part uh, framing why we need an eco-economy, and I'm not going to sit here and debate William Reese about the, uh, the reality that we're going to create an eco-economy to save the planet, but why do we need an eco-economy? <clears throat> We are cursed to live in interesting times. The human enterprise is in a precarious state of ecological overshoot, hmm. propelled by excessive economic activity and growing populations. Eco-overshoot exists when the human demand for renewable resources exceeds ecosystems, regenerative capacities, and waste discharges from people and their economies exceed ecosystems' assimilative and recycling capabilities. This is the archetypal definition of biophysical unsustainability. So remember, this was written in uh, 2021. <clears throat> Overshoot day for 2021 occurs on July 29th. This is the date by which humanity's collective bioresource consumption and waste production will have exhausted nature's buzz budget for the year. From July 29th on, we will be maintaining ourselves and our cumulative manufactured capital assets and growing the economy 
by further eroding remaining stocks of so-called natural capital. Can you say fish stocks, forests, arable soils, biodiversity, groundwater, etc., and overfilling nature's failing waste sinks. Think climate change. Society's current environmental obsession, industrial society currently emits about 37 billion tons of CO2, of which about half is accumulating in the atmosphere. In 2021, carbon dioxide will average over 416 parts per million, up 48% from the pre-industrial concentration of 280 and still growing at almost three parts per million per year. Ecological overshoot is a recent phenomenon. <clears throat> Anatomically modern Homo sapiens have been around for over 300,000 years, but took nearly the whole of that period to reach a population of just 1 billion in the early 19th century. Then, in only 200 years, less than 1 1,500th as much time as the first 1 billion, human numbers have be ballooned by a factor of seven and will top 7.0, well, as we already know, have topped 8 billion now. At the same time, real gross world product increased more than 100 fold and per capita incomes, can you say consumption, increased by a factor of 13. 25 in rich countries, of course, Earth did not get any larger. <clears throat> we can extract two important lessons directly from the sudden exponential expansion of the human enterprise. First, the entire phenomenon was made possible by fossil fuels. Gross world product and fossil energy consumption, along with their carbon emissions, have increased in lockstep. A similar relationship holds within in individual industrial nations with readily explicable variations. Obviously, other products of the scientific revolution such as improving public health, contributed to the boom, but fossil fuels were essential. Fossil fuels power the global industrial machine. They were and remain the principal means by which humans acquired access to all the food and other material resources needed to expand the human enterprise at virtually full biological potential. In population ecology terms, rapidly evolving technology and abundant cheap energy eliminated many of the negative feedbacks, such as disease, food, and other resource shortages that historically held our populations in check. Human numbers and virtually all material flows associated with Homo sapiens responded with exponential exuberance in what some authors have termed the great acceleration <clears throat> the, the super exponential expansion of the human enterprise enabled by the scientific revolution really took off with the extensive use of fossil fuels in the 19th century. Second, 
of perhaps 15,000 generations of humans, only the most recent 10 generations or so have experienced sufficient population and economic growth and technological change in their lifetimes to notice. For 99.9% of human evolutionary history, human numbers everywhere fluctuated in the vicinity of local carrying capacities as the latter varied with shifting climate and other ecological variables, including bouts of plague, which in the 14th century wiped out a third to half of the Eurasian population in just a few years. In short, while the present generation and other recent cohorts of Homo sapiens take continuous growth to be the norm, most economists get nervous if growth falls much below a healthy 2 to 3 to percent per year, which means GDP doubles every 23 to 35 years. The past few decades of explosive growth comprise the single most anomalous period in human history. And I'm pretty sure we uh, really got into that in our interview, if I remember <clears throat> talking about how the past few decades of explosive growth comprise the single most anomalous period in human history. Concern for ecological overshoot, per se, has yet to penetrate. Huh economic and developmental policy circles. Few politicians have even heard of it. Nevertheless, ecological overshoot arguably constitutes a crisis of unprecedented proportions. Ecological overshoot is the meta problem. Issues like climate change, plunging biodiversity, tropical deforestation, acidifying oceans, expanding deserts, soil and landscape degradation, air, water, and land pollution, resource scarcity, and completion, etc., while serious in themselves are all are all mere symptoms of this greater malaise called ecological overshoot. Hmm. Consider the present relationship between modern techno-industrial society and the living ecosphere is analogous, almost homologous, to the relationship of a malignant parasite to its host. A parasite is an organism that lives on a host organism and gains its own vitality at the expense of the vitality of its host. In ecologist jargon, humans are natural macro consumers organisms that necessarily live by consuming other macroscopic organisms. However, when in overshoot, the maintenance and growth of the human enterprise is achieved in part through the overconsumption of plant and animal biomass and the degradation of the ecosphere. Here is malignancy. Plants, non-human animals, and countless species of bacteria and fungi living in community effectively constitute the living tissues of the ecosphere. Some would say Gaia. 
the symptoms of overshoot, biodiversity loss, fisheries collapses, eroding soils, shrinking forest, pollution, etc., and the loss of associated life support functions are ample evidence of tissue destruction and failing eco-vitality. Like any other ill-adapted parasite, <clears throat> modern techno-industrial culture is systematically, even enthusiastically, consuming the biophysical basis of its own existence. There is clearly something fundamentally dysfunctional about the world's dominant socio-economic system. Do you think so? <clears throat> All right, the remainder of this chapter, and I'm only going to have, I won't even get through the first chapter, guys. This is a long thing. The, the remainder of this chapter unfolds in two parts. The following section describes how humanity that self-proclaimed most intelligent of species got into this potentially terminal predicament. I argue that ecological overshoot is not a problem amenable to technological fixes, but rather a meta-problem with deep roots in both biology and culture. The final section outlines key elements of one form of biocultural adaptation. And this is the part that we are not going, we're just going to stick to the first part. We are not getting into the second part where a little bit of hopium creeps in where uh, William talks about how we must reconceive the economy and society as cultural components of a regenerative human ecological niche, one that contributes to the functional integrity of supportive ecosystems. Is there any other way to rescue human civilization from itself and restore vitality to the ecosphere? All I'm going to do is say this, and then I'm going to shut up. It, it, it's irrelevant, the question, whether it's the only way or not. Whether it is the only way or not doesn't matter because it is not going to happen. Ain't going to happen. I know it as much as I respect William Reese. William Reese knows damn well that humans will not reconceive the economy and society as cultural components of a regenerative human ecological niche, one that contributes to the functional integrity of supportive ecosystems. Everything humans have ever done from the day we climbed down from the trees and will continue doing right up until civilization collapses and we go extinct is we are robbing the functional integrity of our own supportive ecosystems. So I am not going to waste my breath with this unrealistic hopium that we're going to turn this freight train around. We're just going to let uh, William Reese uh, explain the freight train to us for people uh, who do not understand this. So how did we get here from there? In one respect, humans came into ecological overshoot honestly Population outbreaks are a common temporary phenomenon in among wild species enjoying unusually abundant resources. 
indeed human overshoot is the predictable outcome of contemporary cultural nurture combined with ancient human nature. Some people uncomfortable acknowledging their animal selves may dispute the genetic component. However, the fact is that we humans are animals, large energy demanding mammals to be precise. And like all extant species, Homo sapiens has evolved over time. Like it or not, we owe much to our evolutionary heritage and are still subject to the forces of natural selection. It should be no surprise, therefore, that we share various adaptive characteristics, including fundamental behavioral predispositions with other living creatures. So, are Homo sapiens unsustainable by nature? Two such evolved Two such evolved predispositions are particularly relevant to ecological overshoot unless or until unless or until constrained by negative feedbacks, populations of Homo sapiens will tend to one expand to occupy all accessible habitats and two, use all available resources. Excelling at these traits would obviously be adaptive and help ensure the survival of any species in the competitive struggle for existence. Indeed, this fact highlights one important factor that distinguishes humans from the rest of the pack. In the case of Homo sapiens, and much to our competitive advantage, accessible and available are constantly being upgraded by technology. There is no shortage of empirical evidence to support these assertions. Consider that with the possible exception of various rodents that ride our coattails, like the rodents uh, that have infested this tiny house, keeping me up all night, yeah, with the exception of my little friends, uh, my little roommates here in the tiny house, humans have expanded to occupy the most extensive geographic range of any vertebrate organism. Not only do we occupy all habitable land masses and ecosystems on Earth, but we are capable of existing in some of the ostensibly least hospitable habitats on this planet, and we now contemplate establishing colonies on such dead rocks as the moon and Mars. Does anyone imagine that if a new resource-rich continent were to be discovered that we would leave it in pristine condition in, in, in acknowledgement that we have messed up everywhere else? Well, I guess we're going to find out, brother, with Antarctica. Uh, I, I just can't believe how little press Antarctica is. There's an entire continent uh, waiting for us to rape and pillage that nobody's talking about. Anyway, <clears throat> on the resource use side, Many of the symptoms of overshoot, from fisheries collapse to landscape degradation, are the direct result of systematic over-exploitation facilitated by ever-improving 
fossil powered technology. Factory freezer trawlers scour the ocean floor, destroying whole seabed ecosystems while 18 ton, 600 horsepower combines harvest food grains from over fertilized fields and behemoth earth movers rearrange the face of the planet in scrounging forever diminishing deposits of essential mineral resources. And of course, that's getting ready to ramp up into overdrive, uh, moving into the green uh, energy revolution. <clears throat> Homo sapiens may not be the only tool using primate that tends to deplete essential resources, but we are undeniably better at it than any other species. Fowler and Hobbes back in 2003 demonstrated that in terms of energy use, and carbon dioxide emissions, biomass consumption, and several additional ecologically significant indicators. Human demands on their supportive ecosystems dwarf those of similar species by 10 to a hundred fold. Competitive superiority has clearly served our species well, but the consequences for other species have been devastating. So now let's look at the social construction of reality. <clears throat> Innate behaviors are by no means the only factor responsible for overshoot. Maladaptive cultural norms play at least an equivalent role, but there is an interesting twist. We humans uniquely socially construct our lived realities. More accurately, humans socially construct conceptual frameworks through which we interpret reality everything from simple ideas to entire cognitive frameworks. Can you say tribal myths, religious doctrines? Well, tribal myths are religious doctrines. Anyway, economic models, political ideologies, academic paradigms, cultural narratives, and don't forget scientific theories are products of the human mind birthed in language, including mathematics, massaged through social discourse, can you say YouTube, and finally accepted as truth or received wisdom by agreement among members of the very social group who have created the construct. There are several important corollaries. First, the conceptual frames through which we perceive reality determine the quality and characteristics of the reality we perceive. Second, we are compelled to live out of our constructed realities as if they were real. Third, if people do not understand this process, and most do not, then they <coughs> will live out their lives taking their experience of reality to be the only possible right and true reality. They will be utterly unaware that many of their most important behaviors and choices are determined largely unconsciously by myths, models, and narratives that our culture has essentially made up. The problem is that many of these constructs are little more 
than shared illusions, otherwise known as gross errors about, rather than insights into the nature of reality. Yes. So what happens when social constructs are fundamentally flawed? I think we're finding that out day by day. Okay. I anyway, anyway, guys, I'm sorry. This uh, just for time's sake. This is interesting stuff, uh, but I've got to skip over it. I highly recommend you go on here and. Uh, and, and read this entire thing uh, where he, he gets into this excellent uh, discussion about neoliberal economic models uh, being crude abstractions that omit crucial aspects of reality. And that could be a whole nother rant, but uh, just for time's sake, uh, I have to skip ahead. So he wraps up that section with the statement, the remaining question is whether the human enterprise can adapt before the environment assumes dominance and destroys it. So now what? getting real about ecological overshoot. So we're going to get real. Ecological overshoot exists when total energy and material flows through the economy exceed the productive and assimilative capacities of the ecosphere. The only way that global society can address overshoot and regain effective control is through absolute reductions in energy and material throughput. Since total throughput is the sum, the sum of individual consumer demands, overshoot implies that Earth cannot sustain even current average per capita consumption. Thus, overshoot is not merely a technical issue. Overshoot is a biocultural phenomenon that must be addressed through significantly dematerialized lifestyles combined with greater equity and significantly reduced populations. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Significantly reduced populations. How significant? By one conservative estimate, the human ecological footprint, defined as the area of bioproductive land and water ecosystems required to support the human enterprise sustainably, you know, talking in a human enterprise of 8 billion people, sustainably is about 21 billion hectares, that's about 50 million acres, I mean, 50, I'm sorry, 50 billion acres compared to the total available bio capacity of just over 12 billion hectares, otherwise known as 30 billion acres. So, we have overshot our global car carrying capacity by more or less 73%. In short, achieving sustainability would require reducing human demands 
on the ecosphere by at least 42 percent. And uh, so, uh, guys, I'm just going to, uh, you know, what are the options to reducing demand on this planet by 42 percent? Do your own math. <clears throat> Any planned contraction would not be across the board. For sustainability with justice, moral, and ethical considerations demand that wealthy consumers, those mainly responsible for overshoot, bear the brunt of material cutbacks. Yeah, right. As early as 1993, analysts recognized that industrialized world reductions in material throughput, energy use, and environmental degradation of over 90% of over 90% will be required by the year 2040 to meet the needs of a growing world population fairly within the planet's ecological means. There you go. We're certainly on track for that 90% reduction. Some people will object that such seemingly extreme intentional adjustments to consumer lifestyles are simply not in the cards. Yes, some people will object that such extreme intentional adjustments to consumer lifestyles are simply not in the cards. Ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen. Anyway, perhaps so. There you go. Perhaps so, but we may have no choice. First, over expansion by the human enterprise was catalyzed by the unprecedented abundance of food and other resources made possible by fossil fuels continued resource abundance will be necessary to maintain growth or even current average consumption levels. This may not be possible huh? because of increasing mineral resource scarcity, land degradation, failing water supplies, growing energy uncertainty, and the sheer scale of ongoing ecosystems destruction. Uh, then he goes into all of this uh, one and a half C target. I'm not going to insult your intelligence with that. Uh, then he's talking about uh, the, the global community's attempt to transition from fossil fuels to so-called green renewable energy sources. Many sources claim that such a transition is not only technically feasible, but can be achieved with a minimum of disruption while stimulating investment and high quality employment in every jurisdiction. Yes, citizens are being urged to believe that, quote, every region on earth can replace fossil fuels with renewable energy to keep warming below one and a half C and provide reliable energy access to all. However, despite promotional hype about wind turbines and solar <clears throat> where most uh, renewable energy investment is going, and now hydrogen and 
despite progress in elect electricity generation in some favored locations, there are many, I'm sorry, there are myriad theoretical and practical reasons why modern renewable energies cannot quantitatively substitute for fossil fuels. Several extended lifestyle studies suggest that the energy return on energy invested in wind and solar is insufficient to power modern society. Yes. Ferroni and Hopkirk demonstrate that in mid-latitudes, solar energy is actually a net energy sink. Its manufacture, installation, and maintenance consume more energy than the system produces. In a commentary on the now considerable series of dubious technological fairy tales for reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050, three climate scientists agree with the present analysis that Quote, the only way to keep humanity safe is the immediate and sustained radical cuts to greenhouse gas emissions in a socially just way. All of which means that the renewable energy will save us strategy is a dead End. One more time. Thank you, Bill Reese. The renewable energy will save us strategy is a dead end. Absent a more comprehensive exit plan, humanity will soon confront a chaotic combination of significantly reduced energy supplies, economic contraction, food and other resource shortages, increasing civil unrest, and geopolitical conflict, otherwise known as the collapse of civilized order. Of course, should modern techno-industrial society decide simply to party on while economic fossil fuel energy supplies last, which seems increasingly to be the de default position of governments, we will face more disastrous climate impacts and economic contraction accompanied by widespread famine, mass migration, domestic turmoil, international chaos, and systems collapse. Either way, it is past time for the world community to acknowledge and authentically internalize reality. Plan for a cooperative, dignified contract contraction of our eco footprint or face the prospect that the ecosphere unleashed will indeed come to dominate and destroy the human system. All right, guys, what do you think? Are, is humanity going to plan for a cooperative, dignified contraction of our eco footprint? Choice number one. Or does humanity face the prospect that the ecosphere unleashed will indeed come to dominate and 
destroy the human system. We all know the answer to that. Uh, Bill Reese knows the answer to that as well as anyone listening to this does. But he goes on uh, for the second half of this essay. Uh, just uh, I I anyway, I'm not going to talk trash about uh, Bill Reese if he wants to go off into La La Land talking about how uh, uh, how uh, humans uh, are going to plan for a cooperative, dignified contraction of our ecological footprint. He can uh, have at it, but I'm going to stop there. Uh, and uh, well, I think I'm going to go over to top documentary films.com recommendation of the day. They have recommended a new documentary, Is Water the New Gold? Talking about the uh, upcoming water wars unfolding all across this planet. That is how I'm going to spend my Sunday night. Anyway, get out there and enjoy your water wars while you still can. Bye, guys.